things I love about children is that they can teach us very important lessons. Amen? Amen. Thankfulness matters. And I believe that thankfulness may be one of the ingredients that is missing from the lives of many believers that are actually preventing them from experiencing the fullness of what God intends for their lives. And so this morning, we're going to take a look at a story about thankfulness and how and why it is so important for us to be intentional about thanking God for everything that he has done and everything that we're believing for him to do. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 6 this morning. Do not be anxious about anything. Now I'm just going to start, stop right there and say, yeah, okay. Paul didn't have 2020 in mind when he wrote this verse, did he? Do not be anxious about anything. But he gives a solution. He says, but in everything, say everything. By prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So the answer to anxiety, the answer to worry, the answer to depression, the answer to fear, the answer to all of these negative emotions is prayer with thanksgiving. Many of us are good at the prayer part but we forget about the thanksgiving. In Luke chapter 17, starting at verse 11, we have a story about thankfulness. It says, Now Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, and he was passing along between Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered a village, he was met by ten lepers who stood at a distance. Now, a couple of things I want you to pick up here. The first thing is that there were these lepers. There was a leper colony. Now, leprosy in the Old Testament was pretty much like the AIDS virus today. Um, Maybe even, maybe more like the AIDS virus in the 1980s. It was considered to be the most horrible disease imaginable. If you got it, it was just basically a death sentence. The other thing that made leprosy so horrible was that if you contacted this skin disease, you were considered to be unclean. And if you were considered to be unclean, then as a Jewish person, you were no longer able to participate in everyday Jewish life. In Leviticus chapter 13, 45, it says, The leprous person who has the disease shall wear torn clothing and let the hair of their head hang loose. And he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean as long as he has the disease. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So if you were found to have leprosy, that basically meant that your life was over. This was a very serious thing. You weren't allowed to be around people. You were all by yourself. The only people you got to hang out with were other lepers who were just as miserable as you are. The second thing that I want you to see here is that it says that they were at a distance. They stood at a distance. The reason for this is they could not come within 100 strides or 100 yards of a clean person. If they did, it was punishable by immediate death. So imagine your entire life, you have to wear old, ratty clothes. You can't do anything with your hair. It just has to grow out however it grows. You have to cover part of your face. And every time you see someone, you have to scream out your worst shame all day, every day. And you can't ever come within 100 yards of another person. That's the position these people were at. Now, you may not be there, but I'm guessing that there are some of you who feel like a leper. You feel like the black sheep in your family. You feel like an outcast. You feel like a failure, like you don't fit in with everybody else, like you're too embarrassed. There's too much shame. There's too many mistakes. Too many bad things have been done to you. And so you keep yourself at a distance from people, and you also keep yourself at a distance from God. But even if this morning you come in, whether it be because of sin or because of hurt, if you come in here this morning and you find yourself away from God and you feel unclean, I'm here to tell you that Jesus still sees you 
And he will still move in your life if you allow him to. In verse 13, it continues, and it says, The lepers, they lifted up their voices, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us. Jesus, Master, have mercy upon us. I don't know if you've ever been here before, but sometimes your life can be so full of pain, so full of brokenness, that you can actually get to a place where you just don't even know what to pray. Anybody ever been there before? You just don't even know what words to use. Well, if you ever find yourself in that position where you feel distance from God and you don't know what words to use, let this be your prayer. Jesus, Master, have mercy upon me. This is one of the most profound, powerful prayers in Scripture because, first of all, it recognizes that Jesus is in control. It recognizes that he is the one with the authority. He is the one with the power. He is the one with the answers. The second thing it does is it basically just lays it all out at his feet and says, you just make best of it. Have mercy. There's not even a lot of specific asks in here. It's just that I trust that you know what is best. Have mercy upon me. In verse 14, it says, when Jesus saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. Now, did you notice that Jesus did not just say, you're well? No, he said, I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. Why did Jesus say that? Jesus said that because Jesus came to fulfill the law. He came as the embodiment of perfection. Jesus came to show us how to correctly live in relationship with the Father. And so God's law said that if you had leprosy and you wanted to be proclaimed to be clean, you had to go to a priest and the priest had the power to determine whether or not the leprosy was gone. So Jesus doesn't even talk about healing. He simply says, I want you to go and show yourself to the priest. They were not healed immediately in that moment. And I think some of you are experiencing a level of frustration with God this morning because you've been asking for God to move in your life and it hasn't happened immediately according to the way you think it should happen. And so you're going, where's God at? He doesn't care about me. He's abandoned me. He doesn't love me. No, they had to walk in faith that Jesus was working. They had to walk in faith and do the things that God had told them to do, believing that he was going to come through for them. You're called to the same thing this morning. Whatever it is that you're asking God to do in your life, you have to walk toward that thing in faith. We want God to do these big, flashy miracles when he's already done the greatest miracle that we will ever need. He died on the cross for your sins. He rose victoriously from the grave and he has placed his Holy Spirit inside of you, making it so that you don't have to continue making the same mistakes that you've made. The big miracle has already been accomplished. In addition to that, he's given us the word of God. He inspired human beings just like you and me. And over time, over decades, over hundreds of years, these words were compiled into what we call the Bible, the inspired and errant perfect word of God that we have at our disposal 24 hours a day, seven days a week to give us direction and guidance for our lives. Guys, the Bible is a miracle. The Bible in itself is a miracle. But there's something about being human that we like the big show right? We want, the, we want the magician to, to come out on the stage, and we want the, we want the explosion and the light and the fire, and we want to be wowed. And so when God doesn't wow us, we tend to feel slighted, or we tend to feel like it's not as big of a deal, when in reality, most of the miracles that you need in your life are going to be normal, everyday decisions that you can make. There's a lot of people in here, you're praying for help, but you're treating your body like crap. There's a lot of people in here praying for a good relationship, but you're treating your relationship like an amusement park instead of something that's meant to honor and glorify God. 
You're asking God for money, but you'll go and spend your money on smoke or spend it on $150 shoes instead of using your money to, number one, glorify God, and number two, to pay your bills. Too, too far? In 2 Kings chapter 5, we see another leper who had an issue like this. He was looking for the wow factor. He went to the prophet Elisha and asked Elisha to do something about his leprosy. Elisha sent him a message saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored. You will be clean. But this man, Naaman, he was angry. And he went away saying, behold, you know, I thought he would surely come out to me and he would stand and he would call upon the name of his Lord. He would wave his hands over the place and he would cure the leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than the waters of Israel? Could I not have washed in them and been clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. But his servants came near and said to him, my father, it is a great word that the prophet has spoken to you. Will you not do it? Has he actually said to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and he dipped himself, dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored. What was Naaman's problem? Naaman wanted this big thing. He wanted the flash and the glamour. And you know what he probably wanted? He wanted some notoriety. He wanted some people to look at him. And God gave him a very simple thing to do. Just go wash in the Jordan seven times. And he's like, that's it? That's it? And this morning, God is saying to you, you know what? If you'll, if you'll live my way, if you'll honor my word and you'll put me first and you'll love me first and you'll love people second and you'll get into my word and allow my word to be a light to your feet, all of the problems in your life that you're struggling with right now, they're going to start lining up and getting answered. Yeah. And we go, no, I want the Red Sea to get divided. I want plagues, baby. Like, I want something big that I can see. And God's going, I've already done the big. Right. Now you do the small. Amen. And if you're willing to do the small, everything will work out. Jesus told them to do it God's way. But a lot of people miss out on their miracle because they refuse to do it God's way. So I want to, um, will you blow this up for me real quick? So the balloon this morning, in this condition, represents where we're at. Yeah, go ahead and tie it. This balloon right here represents where we want to be, right? This is the balloon fulfilling its purpose. This is the balloon blown up. This is the balloon looking the way that we want it to look. So this is the answer to prayer. This is us right now. The problem is that before we actually allow God to do anything, we, uh, we do some things our way. Sean, would you blow that balloon up, please? Come on. Come on. All right, bring it back here. Thank you. We get frustrated with God for not answering prayers, but the reason that the prayers aren't getting answered is we're sabotaging the prayers because we're doing it our way. We're praying for God to do it his way, and then we're going and doing it our way. Guess what? God won't contradict himself. In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You make it about yourself. In verse 15, it continues. It says, so then one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, he turned back, praising God with a loud voice. And he fell on his feet. I'm sorry. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. He was a Samaritan. That detail is going to become important in just a second. The fact that this man turned back reveals that there was a deeper change inside of him. You see, the answer to his prayer, the miracle that Jesus did in his life, it touched his heart, which is the purpose of answered prayers and miracles. They're meant to touch our heart, not just our circumstances. 
When God's answered prayer, when the miracle that we receive only touches our situation, it does nothing beneficial for us other than a temporary change. But without thankfulness, that temporary change has not become permanent. In Luke chapter 7, we see a picture of another woman who shows extreme thankfulness to Jesus. And like this Samaritan, she's another woman who understands what it feels like to be an outcast. She is a a woman of ill repute who has received forgiveness and grace by Jesus. And the people don't like her expression of love and thankfulness that she shows. And so Jesus gives them a story. Luke chapter 7, verse 41. It says, a certain money lender had two people in debt to him. One owed him $500. The other owed him him $50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon, one of the Pharisees present, said, well, the one, I suppose, for whom had canceled the larger debt. And Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Then he turned toward the woman. But he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment, with perfume. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little loves little. You see, one of the things about unthankfulness that it reveals is that we don't really get who Jesus is unthankfulness reveals that we haven't really fully received the extent of the forgiveness that Jesus provides. We're still trying to do some of it on our own. We still think that we're able to be responsible for our own mess, and we haven't fully received the complete package that Jesus has to offer. So we'll, we'll give him a little bit, but we won't give him the whole thing. We'll give him parts of our lives, but we won't fully surrender. And a lack of thankfulness shows that. It's the evidence of that. Now, something else that I want you to see here is when God doesn't always answer prayer at the timing or in the way that we think. Anybody experienced that in here before? And I believe that the reason for this is that some people become like spoiled children. Now, I have an eight-year-old and a four-year-old in my house, and there are times when I'm in the kitchen, and I'm making something to eat, I'm getting something to drink, and I'll hear this sweet little voice, Daddy, which, I mean, automatically I'm in, right? Will you please get me some lemonade? Of course I will, baby. Of course. You want ice in it? You want it in the Minnie Mouse cup? right? Do you want a pony with that? Like, what do you want? There are other times where I hear, dad, give me some lemonade. What now? (laughs) And what do it, what is the, what are the words that come out of every parent's mouth? Your legs broke. Get up off that couch. Get your hind end in here. Get your own lemonade, you spoiled little brat, right? (laughs) Same demand, completely asked in different directions. One is with thankfulness, one is being spoiled. Doing something for someone that is not thankful is called spoiling. And God does not spoil because spoiling creates self-centeredness. In Luke chapter 17, verse 17, it says, So Jesus answered, Were not ten of you cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one else found to return and give praise to God except for this foreigner? So we know that he's a Samaritan. Now Jesus doubles down on this and he calls him a foreigner. There's a reason for that. It implies that the other people with him were not. Which means that as Israelites, they should have known better. But somewhere along the way, they had become used to God 
and they become too comfortable with him. There's times when my children are reminded that I am dad, and with that comes authority and also goodness. And so out of thankfulness, they will ask the right way. And there's times when in their humanness, they forget about that and they begin to demand things of me and they're not getting anything. God's the same way. There is a big difference between entitled and expectant. Entitled comes from being spoiled. Expectancy comes from being in relationship. My children know that I'm their daddy. They know that I love them. They know that I want to give good gifts to them. The other lepers, they just wanted to get back into society. They were focused on what was coming next, so they forgot about what had just occurred. Only the foreigner recognized the goodness of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Do you think God will answer your prayer if he knows that you will just forget about him and go back to life as usual. Might I suggest that maybe you find yourself in the situation that you're in, not because God doesn't love you, but because he wants to get your attention. And maybe God has not yet relieved your circumstances or answered your prayer for that heart's desire because he knows that if you get that thing you're praying for, you will immediately forget about him and go back to distraction and comfort. Answered prayers should draw us to Jesus. Otherwise, all they do is deepen our selfishness. So what are you asking for? And what would you do if you got it? Would you just go back to doing what you were doing before? Let me ask you this. What is the point of that healing you want? Or that provision for finances? Why do you want that relationship? Why are you seeking freedom? To be comfortable? God's going to say nope to that. God wants to answer your prayer so that you can see how good he is. But he will not do something that would potentially lead you away from him. You know, I hear people make all kinds of promises all the time of what they would do if God would just answer their prayer. Man, we lie to ourselves, don't we? We can lie to ourselves all day long. You know, God, if you just let me have that promotion at work, man, if you get that promotion at work, we'll never see you again because you'll become a workaholic or you'll want to spend all that new money on toys and we'll not, we won't see you. God, if you would just let me be in a relationship with somebody that gets me, with somebody that loves me, you know the number one reason why people stop going to church? They get with the wrong person. I see it over and over and over and over again. Anytime somebody introduces me to a new person, my first prayer is, dear Lord, let this person love you. Because there's a good chance that we're not going to see them again. And it breaks my heart. God will not give you good gifts if they will only end up hurting you. In Luke chapter 11, 11 through 12, it says, What parent or what father among you, if his child asks for a fish, will instead give them a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will instead give him a scorpion? No good parent that loves their child, gives their child something that will hurt them when they ask for something. No, parents give good gifts to their kids. When I was 16 years old, my mother had this red Mustang. And this red Mustang, she washed it like six times a week. It was shiny. It was fast. It was beautiful. And I was a spoiled 16-year-old, by the way. So I thought that when I turned 16, my mom was just going to hand over the keys to the Mustang. <laughs> Instead, they bought me a, a nice 16-year-old pickup that went zero to 60 eventually. <laughs> the reason for that is because if they would have given me the Mustang, I probably would not have made it to 17. Or I would have spent so much money on tickets and insurance 
that we'd have to sell our house. They would not give me a gift that would only hurt me. They gave me something that would be for my betterment. In verse 19, it says that Jesus said to the man, rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. Thankfulness is a catalyst of the faith process. Thankfulness has to be part of faith. It expects good because it knows that Jesus is good. But we, look, we can act like spoiled children. We want to command and we want to take authority in Jesus' name, but then we forget to actually give honor due the name. You may disagree with me, but I am convinced, based on 18 years of full-time ministry, that the reason that we have seen a decline in the miraculous in the American church is not because of a lack of faith, but rather because of a lack of thankfulness. Because we want to spend it all on ourselves. And we make our faith about us. We don't want to make demands of God. We want to be children who respond in faith because we know the goodness of our Father. Sean, would you uh, blow that balloon up, please? Oh, wrong one. That's the one with the hole in it. My bad. Now hold on to it. Just hang on to it right there. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Sean just blew up the balloon. The balloon that he had at first, like this, this represented the potential of where his heart was at, what he wanted. This represents God's answer to prayer. This represents the miracle that you're seeking. But what he just did was he poured in his faith. It's faith that blew up the balloon. Let it go. But without thankfulness, it deflates. You see, thankfulness is what ties the balloon and allows the miracle and the work of God to remain in our lives. And there's a promise with this. Verse 7 says that if you'll do that, thank you, Sean, if you will do this, if you will pray and be thankful, the peace of God, which surpasses, it's bigger than anything you can understand, it will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. The path to peace is thankfulness. Amen? The worship team is going to make their way up here this morning. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend some time being thankful to Jesus. We're just going to lose ourselves in some praise and worship for a few minutes. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand up onto your feet. And during this last song or two, why don't you think back over 2020 and think back about all the things that you're thankful for. And while you're worshiping, just tell the Lord between you and him right where you're, sit, right where you're standing, tell the Lord why you are thankful. And then in addition to that, I want you to think ahead. What are the things that you're believing for? What are the miracles that you want to see God do? What are the ways that you want to see God move in your life? And I want you to give him thanks for those things too. Amen? Amen. Let's worship the Lord.